Hello everyone and welcome back to part 2 of my review of the American Museum of Natural History. I went to the museum a couple of weeks ago at this point. I released part 1 also a couple of weeks ago. And now we're ready for part 2. So for part 1, I took a bunch of videos while I was exploring with my fiance. And we had a great time. Uh, unfortunately, you can hear people talking in the back and stuff. But, you know, it's a public place. I don't own the museum. Um, so everyone should be able to come and enjoy these creatures. Uh, but now for those things that I wanted to talk a little bit more about, more in depth, or that kids are just screaming over, uh, I took a lot of pictures too. And I wanted to include those. Uh, you can't fit everything into just short 10 second segments. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, and I'm not even going to get to half of the animals that they presented here. There were just way too many. There's so much content. I urge you, people who also do paleontology videos, come to this museum, um, look at what they have to, and review the other the other exhibits that I, I missed. Okay, this isn't a picture that I took. It's the picture I got online. You can tell because Teddy Roosevelt was there. Rip. Alright, so guys, let's dig this up. Uh, first off, yeah, here's in the lobby we have the Barasaurus and the Allosaurus fragilis. Two creatures from the Morris Information in late Jurassic North America. Um, this would be about like 150 million years ago. Barasaurus is a massive diplodocid that would have been about uh, maybe 27 meters long. So, a huge... A huge chungus of an animal. It was a pretty slender diplodocid, though a long one. Um, and then here we have an Allosaurus fragilis, which might be like 8 meters long in length. So, uh, yeah, this guy is screwed, pretty much. If, if it gets stomped on by the Barosaurus, it's like immediately dead. I don't care what Stephen Fry showed you. No, it would die pretty instantly. Um, yeah, it's trying to get the, the youngling, but it's being defended by the adult, although not quite sure if that would be accurate. Um, what we know of sauropods that they probably lived in herds with animals their own age. So juveniles would be with other juveniles rather than being protected by the adults, and adults would live with other adults. Uh, they were so big they needed to eat a lot of food, so if they stayed in one place and waited for the eggs to hatch and uh, took care of the young in a single area, they would deforestate the entire place. So that's probably not what they did. So the Allosaurus probably would have had an easier time with this meal. Also, um, sorry if you're one of these people whose faces ended up in the pictures. I'm not going to take the time to blur out every single face. Moving on. Alright, this is me and a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, I did mention this briefly in part one, but seriously, it's Tyrannosaurus. I can't give it all the love and credit that it deserves. It is called the King of the Dinosaurs for a reason. This was uh, probably the largest land predator to ever exist. I know a new new research came out that said that Giganotosaurus and uh, the largest specimens that we have, like a fragmentary lower jaw that shows a large Giganotosaurus individual and our largest T-Rex individual were probably the same weight, 3.4 tons, 3.4 metric tons, and we don't have a lot of Giganotosaurus remains, so we can find Giganotosaurus that were bigger than Tyrannosaurus, potentially. Guys, we shouldn't get so hung up on who is the largest though, I mean, we can appreciate them for what they are. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. They were impressive, wonderful animals, and they lived and died without caring. If they were larger than a predator that lived thousands of miles away, millions of years apart, it didn't matter to them. Um, but yes, back to the Tyrannosaurus itself. Um, you see, it's like a very boxy, deep-chested animal, which is why it's so heavy. They're so much heavier than similarly lengthed animals, so they're bigger than things that are the same length as them. Man, you see uh, those just bone-crushing jaws had the largest bite force of any terrestrial predator ever. That one isn't for the bait. Um, some estimates put it at like 6,000 to 7,000 pounds of force, and all the way up to 
approaching 13,000 pounds of force. So not only are you getting bitten and stabbed, but it's like you're getting like hit by a car at the same time. Okay, you can see like these bumps and knobs. Those probably were attachment sites for um, keratin, keratinous bumps and ornamentation that it would have had. Um, above the eyes, down the snout. Maybe for display. Probably display. That's what scientists say when they can't figure out what the heck something was used for. Probably not using them to bump heads together, that's for sure. Um, Alright, let's move on from Tyrannosaurus. Sorry, you're great, but you gotta move on to other creatures. Um, we have its cousin, its relative, Albertosaurus. This is a smaller Tyrannosaurid uh, from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. Lived just a few million years before T Rex, 71 to 68 million years ago, and it was the dominant predator in its ecosystem. But I'm curious what happened 68 million years ago. Did Albertosaurus go extinct and then uh, Tyrannosaurus or Tyrannosaurus relative appeared in North America and became Tyrannosaurus? Or did Tyrannosaurus show up and outcompete Albertosaurus? I would love to see more research. Uh, more discussion on that switch between the two. Uh, Albertosaurus was an Albertosaurine, Tyrannosaurus was a Tyrannosaurine. These are like the two groups of Tyrannosaurids, though we only have Albertosaurus and Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurines and then a lot of others in Tyrannosaurines. So this would represent like a different model of Tyrannosaurid. Its closest relative was Gorgosaurus, which we saw in the last video, although some in the past have speculated that Gorgosaurus itself is a junior synonym of Albertosaurus and a different species of Albertosaurus, um, though modern scientists and paleontologists don't support that. Anyways, we can move on. Nice to see you, Albertosaurus. Your screen was great in JPOG. Ooh, and here we go. Two dinosaurs that I absolutely love, Ceratosaurus and Dilophosaurus. For the uninformed, Ceratosaurus here, Dilophosaurus here. Let's start with Dilophosaurus, because we started with Ceratosaurus in part one. This is an outdated version of the Dilophosaurus skull. Skulls and fossils, bones, they don't come in neatly packaged, organized specimens like you would see this cast here, this model here. Uh, no, they're fragmentary, they're broken, you have to put the different bits and pieces together, figure out how they attach together, so you might get a distorted view of an animal, and that's kind of what we have here. Uh, Dilophosaurus, I, I mentioned this in part one, but it had a more robust skull, uh, the kink in the jaw was not as prominent, the crest probably would have been larger and could have went back further. Uh, scientists at the time thought that they had narrower, leaner, weaker jaws. It was assumed that Dilophosaurus would have just been a scavenger or a fish or only small prey. But now that we know it had a more robust skull, stronger jaws, we can look at this and say, yeah, this was an apex predator that was feasting on the larger herbivores living in its environment, the, the sauropod ancestors. Uh, living about 93-ish million years ago, I think, somewhere around there. It is one of those first larger body theropods, about 7 meters, still quite not half a ton yet, but um, larger than, say, the Coelophysoids that ruled before it, or Herrerasaurus. And now let's switch over to Ceratosaurus. Uh, Ceratosaurus was a more basal theropod also. It wasn't a tetanurin, like Allosaurids and Tyrannosaurids. Uh, this was a Ceratosaurian, which would have included Ceratosaurus and its relatives, and the Abelosaurids. We saw the Majungasaurus in the last video. <laughs> um, yes, it is Majungasaurus, not Majungatholus, Jurassic Fight Club. So Ceratosaurus would have lived in North America about 150-ish million years ago, along with Allosaurus, the Barosaurus, and other large predators like the Torvosaurus, Sorphagonax. So it had a lot of competition, and there was a time where paleontologists thought that it ate fish and aquatic prey and was semi-aquatic or getting there. Now it's kind of thought of as a generalist predator, eating whatever it can get its jaws around. 
while maybe the larger body theropods in its environment were attacking the larger sauropods that lived with it. Here you can see it does have its three crests. Actually, now that I think about it, you could have called Ceratosaurus Triceratops three horned face, and then Triceratops Ceratosaurus horned lizard. And that's like the alternate reality of it. But back to this reality. Um, <laughs> yeah, these would have been used for display. Maybe they were bright and colorful in real life, like um, their modern relatives, the birds. They definitely were not used for fighting because they're fragile. So if they bumped, they would break. They're, they're clearly not horns for fighting or bumping. So we can assume that they were used for display. Now, whether there was sexual dimorphism going on there or different species or different males had different sized crests to show off their strength and dominance, we don't really know yet. I mean, there's not that much Ceratosaurus material out there. And there also might be three species, though maybe Nasacornis, which it says here is the only valid one, and the other two are just different individuals or different sexes of the same species. There's a lot of unknowns in paleontology, and well, it's frustrating that we don't know them, but it's exciting when we do learn something new. Here is some outdated material. This is a Gastornis, a North American species, but they call it Diatrima, which is an outdated name. We know that even though it was a popular name to use during the 1900s, Diatrima is a junior synonym of Gastornis. You might look at this giant bird and uh, start to cower in fear, but fear not because this would have been a vegetarian. You can see its beak is flat and not hooked like you would expect in, say, a forest racket. <laughs> no, this was flat, probably used to crush seeds and nuts, uh, eat vegetation. So think of this as a giant um, duck, okay? Think of it as a giant duck. It would have went around the Eocene just eating foliage. You don't have to worry about it that much. Uh, it is the closest related to uh, waterfowl of all things today. So that's our best point of reference for this kind of creature. Next up, we have Plateosaurus, which, okay, it has the droopy tail, unfortunately, especially here. Wow, that's a bad... <laughs> bad representation. Yeah, I saw in the comments, they were asking like, yes, uh, skeletons would be expensive to change and remodel, but come on, these these pictures down here? You can probably do that on the cheap. Come on. Come on. At least you can get some accurate representation there, please. But uh, aside from the obvious nitpicks, hey, the hands are kind of they're facing each other. That's nice. And it's shown being bipedal, which is also thought to be the case. Yeah, early on, it was thought to be bipedal. And then, like, towards the 90s, kind of see it being quadrupedal. Uh, you see that in walking with dinosaurs, a like quadrupedal plateosaurus. And now it's back to being bipedal. So we did have it right back in the day. Also, you can see here it says prosauropods. The term prosauropod is catchy to use. It's easy to use. Just describe all the sauropodomorphs that weren't true sauropods that were still bipedal still getting the hang of being a large herbivore um, but weren't quite at the sauropod level yet it's an easy word to use but it is no longer in use it wasn't a natural grouping of animals uh, now you would call a creature like this a plateosaurid plateosaurus is a plateosaurid i'm not blowing anyone's minds there um, so yeah, we're not using prosauropod anymore. Here we have a patasaurus, which is a more robust creature than, say, Diplodocus and Barosaurus. You can see it has those thick legs, thick vertebrae. It was it was built. It's it's a jack Diplodocus. So it is a relative of Diplodocus, Barosaurus, and this this is a very good amount of it. I do appreciate it. It has the appropriate Diplodocid-like head. There was confusion in the 1800s where a Camarasaurus head was attached and associated with uh, Patasaurus remains. Yeah, we, we know that's not the case and it, it would have had a head like this. I, I compare it to a vacuum cleaner where it's just big and flat. 
just made to scoop up leaves and scarf it down whole. It has these a bunch of these spoon-shaped teeth sticking out that would just snip at the leaves and the branches and then scarf it down. It didn't have time to chew and process its food. Now that's a waste of time. Instead, you just swallow rocks and swallow the food whole and let the rocks in the stomach grind up the food. It's a much uh, more efficient process. Well, at least that's their workaround for it. Uh, we saw the hadrosaurids well, and Montosaurus in the last part that actually developed a chewing system. Uh, the feet are pretty good. You see those uh, three claws sticking out from the side. There's going to be one claw on the foot forward. So you can't see that. You can kind of see it here. This mount isn't nearly as good as this one. This is slinky tail to the extreme. But I do I do like this Apatosaurus. And um, Brontosaurus. Oh gosh, Brontosaurus. Man, for years it was so simple. Anyone who said Brontosaurus was wrong. But if you said Apatosaurus, you were right. You were base. You knew what you were talking about. Now, since Brontosaurus, controversially, may be back and may have been an actual genus with slight differences from Apatosaurus, people say Brontosaurus without knowing this. They just missed the entire past hundred years of history, say Brontosaurus because, I don't want to be mean about it, but because they don't know any better and they don't even know about Apatosaurus. But then it makes them kind of right. <laughs> They're right but for the wrong reasons. It's like when you do your math problem and you have the right answer, you just guess the right answer, but you only get partial credit because you showed none of the work to get there. You know what I mean? I know what I mean. All right, moving on. Ooh, next up we have Zephactinus, um, a Cretaceous giant fish. This thing would have been, what, four, five meters long? So a massive fish. Uh, looks like a bulldog, that's that short, robust face ready to just attack its prey. But this thing was like the size of a great white shark swimming in the Cretaceous seas. And it wasn't even the top predator. I mean, you have a fish this big, but still, there were the, the Mosasaurids around. And then, maybe more in freshwater, you had stuff like Dinosuchus. So, um, not great. Not a great time. Oh, and, and big sharks too, like the squally Corax. So even at this massive size, it wasn't the top predator in its environment, but still I wouldn't have wanted to go up against one. Uh, clearly they, were, they weren't they were very picky eaters. Uh, they kind of like downed their food whole, didn't give it a second thought, because we have a specimen of a Zephactinus. It's like, what, 14 feet long, and then ate a two meter fish, and we found it inside its stomach cavity and it died shortly afterwards so maybe the thrashing of this sad fish trying to escape or something uh ended up killing this well not this one but this zephactinus in this situation maybe its stomach got ruptured something like that who knows but clearly they were the kind of guys to just scarf down their food here's another sauropod patagotitan and i wanted to give it a shout out and give it some love because uh, I, I really just use it as a comparison to Argentinosaurus, which is unfair to it. It's it's a great animal in its own right. Lived in Argentina during the Albion stage, the early transitioning into the late Cretaceous. The thing about Patagotitan compared to other Titanosaurs, uh, especially these really massive ones, is that uh, this has multiple specimens and some relatively more complete ones. For other sauropod genre, you might find like a few thigh bones here and there, uh, maybe a vertebrae or something like that, but never that much of a good look at the creature. Patagotitan uh, has a lot more material than these other guys, so it's often using comparisons to them and can be used to fill in some of those gaps. So thank you, Patagotitan. You you're you're you may not be the largest, but you're definitely valuable to paleontology and, and you still matter to me okay you're, you're a great guy it's not you it's me okay moving on <laughs> okay moving on to the ornithischians here we have some lambiosaurus and again a dinosaur i don't focus enough time on they they deserve some love so hadrosaurs are broken up into hadrosaurines like um, edmontosaurus hadrosaurus 
Shantungasaurus, and then you have your Lambiosaurines, like Parasaurolophus, Lambiosaurus, Carithosaurus. So these are the ones with the crazy ornamentation. You can see a bit of Parasaurolophus over here, but then Lambiosaurus has all this wild ornamentation here, and they could have used this. There's a cavity that connects to their airways where they could blow air into it and make some sort of sound. So it's it's fun to see when paleontologists do this. They they make a crest of a Lambiosaurine like Parasaurolophus and then uh, blow air through it and see what kind of sound it made. So it gives us our best glimpse at to what actual sounds dinosaurs were making. But for Lambiosaurus itself, it lived in like the dinosaur park formation or the Lake Cretaceous about 70-ish million years ago. And here we see some uh, good variation. We have two skulls here, but they look pretty different. And it's unclear whether these were, say, different species, uh, different sexes, maybe just different individuals. But sometimes, you know, like Ceratosaurus, it's hard to tell with limited data. And we can't just go back in time and see them for ourselves, so it, it's difficult. Next up, Triceratops, the legendary Triceratops. I didn't take a video of Triceratops, or at least I took a very short one. Something like that. Oh yeah, I just showed the name. There was the species Triceratops serratus that was used. Oh, sorry lady, that was a very clear shot of you. Um, probably a can, who cares. <laughs> but we didn't get to talk about Triceratops proper. Again, uh, uh, lived with Tyrannosaurus in the late Cretaceous, the Maastrichtian, like 68 to 66 million years ago. So right up to the... KPG extinction that wiped out all the dinosaurs. Uh, Triceratops was a chasmosaurine, so chasmosaurine ceratopsians had these three horned faces and less elaborate frills and spikes coming off of the frill, while the centrosaurines had more elaborate frills, the spikes, and then one big nose horn or bump in the later forms rather than having these three big horns coming out of their face. Uh, Chasmosaurines made it towards the very end of the Cretaceous. The Centrosaurines didn't make it that far. They didn't make it into the Maastrichtian, at least from what we found in North America, which is an interesting point of study that I hope we get to see more on. It does seem like there was a drop in biodiversity between the Upper Maastrichtian and the Lower Maastrichtian and the Campanian. Like the Campanian had Lambiosaurines and Hadrosaurines in North America, but the Upper Maastrichtian only had the Hadrosaurines, and they only had Chasmosaurines, and they only had Tyrannosaurines, Tyrannosaurus. So I'm very curious to see what's up with that. Why did these groups of animals survive while their relatives, relatively speaking, did not survive? But one last thing I want to address is the Taurosaurus controversy, and I want this to be Ooh, my next paleo myth or the one after? I really want to do Megalodon and whether or not Megalodon is still alive. I think that has to be next. Sorry, right, Taurosaurus versus Triceratops needs to wait a bit longer. Um, but the theory, from, well, the hypothesis, the idea, whatever you call it from Jack Horner, is that Taurosaurus is the more mature form of Triceratops and that Triceratops, as it grew up, would have became Taurosaurus. So Taurosaurus would be invalid and would be a junior synonym of Triceratops, but this isn't the case. Uh, we have, actually, you know what, do I need to get into it? Yeah, I'll touch on it a little. We have Triceratops that are more mature than Taurosaurus, and there's no clear transition in the frills from this solid frill to the longer, wider frill of Taurosaurus with two giant holes in it. Uh, we don't have that transition. And it also seems like Taurosaurus lived more south in North America, while Triceratops lived more north. I'll need to double check that, but it kind of seems like the case. Okay, we can move on from here. Oof, we are met with the dunk. Skull or shield of Dunkleosteus. Yeah, this was a placoderm, and placoderms were these shielded, bony fish. Again, this is a good example of just a giant face shield that these guys had. Um, this would have lived during the Devonian 350-ish million years ago, so very long time ago. And these are very interesting creatures. 
Dunkleustius and its relatives were some of the first to develop jaws so it can like open and close its mouth at will rather than just swimming forward and kind of filter feeding or sucking in prey. No, it would actually snap at its prey, which gave it an advantage. And actually, Dunkleustius could snap really fast, like open and shut its jaws like within milliseconds. Actually, it would give it an advantage because it might like suck fish or invertebrates into its mouth and then crush it. See that opening motion really fast would suck it in and then it slices down, it crushes its prey. But these aren't teeth here. These are modified parts of its bony armor. They're just shaped in a way that would allow them to slice prey. But it was thought to have been like, what, eight, almost nine meters long, approaching 30 feet in length. But recent estimates placed it at about four meters. So it's not this giant shark-like predator of the ocean. It would have had a different body shape, shorter, stouter. But still, this isn't the dunk being nerfed or it being not as cool. This is still something you don't want to mess with. Oof, here we have an Edmontosaurus mummy. Uh, I believe it's at Edmontosaurus anectins on the casing, but <laughs> I had to get that shot right in there. Oh yeah, get right into the mess of it. Ugh, what is that? Oh my gosh, that just looks like a Komodo dragon with the duck bill. Like, what am I even looking at here? Please, I, I get it, you know, it's expensive, but things like this, you can, you can get something better than that for 10 bucks, come on. Huh, come on, museum. You could do better. Um, this is called a mummy, but not quite really a mummy. When we think of mummies and like the Egyptians, they actually have the skin and tissue preserved. This isn't the actual skin at this point. It's been mineralized. It's the shape, the impression of the skin, but it's not the actual organic material. So it's not technically a mummy, but we still call them dinosaur mummies. Next up, it looks like we have the Diplocallus, but we'll have to save that for next time because we're already going over time. I don't want to keep you here forever. So I'll continue with the Diplocallus and a couple of other animals in a part three. And again, even with three parts, I'm only getting a fraction of what they had to offer here. So remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you next time.